Well, good morning. Happy New Year, everyone. Would you all stand with us this morning? And uh, let's ring in this new year together. Sing it together and worship it to our God. Let every eye be fixed upon King Jesus. Let every tribe and tongue prepare the way. Let every heart be filled with expectation Cause the King is coming The King is coming Open the doors up Come let the light in People get ready Get ready to worship Him Come let the doors up Down and worship Him. 
search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together.
Good morning, Clarkston. Wow, what a way to start the morning. Woo. Um, oh my gosh, it's so good to see everybody again. It's been a long week. Um, so welcome back, everybody. My name is Nicole Rumble, and I'm your guest. I always want to say guest services, but I'm your guest experience coordinator um, here at the Clarkston campus. And I just, again, wanted to welcome you all here. Um, and I did want to also introduce our new series that we're starting today called ID Renewal. So if you want to discover and live in your new identity, we're inviting you on this journey with us. It's a three-week series um, that also comes with a text-in option uh, to receive daily uh, affirmations and inspirations of who God says that you are, to quiet the voices in your head or what society tells you, and just to really remind you um, of who Jesus says you are. So for me personally... Um, my identity is not in my fear, my crippling fear of public speaking, but in my weakness, he is made strong. So I would like to be reminded of that on a daily basis. Uh, so also, if everybody wants to pull out their phones to not only text identity into um, 248-781-2757, but to also pull up your calendars, because I have some really fun things that I want to invite you guys to. Starting with our first event, which is our second annual Hope Water Project Gala. Uh, so this is an evening filled with dinners and um, photo booths and speakers and a silent auction. And there's also entertainment that's going to be provided by the Detroit Youth Choir. So if you remember, if you're America's Got Talent fans, they were actually the runners up in season 14. So you'll have an evening of just listening to their beautiful music. So if you go to kensingtonchurch.org slash gala, you can get more information or purchase your tickets for that event. <clears throat> oh, for the, the identity? Yeah. I can give it to you. It's um, 248, is it up there? Oh, there we go. 781-2757. So if you just text the word identity to that number. Um, our next event that I want to invite everybody to, well, actually, no, just men, unfortunately. Um, but fortunately for them, we have an evening coming up on January 30th. So originally, I think it was scheduled for the 23rd. So if you have that in your calendar, move it to the 30th. Um, this is an evening that is going to be empowering for men um, to just really be inspired to do the work of God. And this is going to be um, hosted at Carter's Plumbing. The address is right up here on the screen. And then Chris Swanson, the um, current uh, sheriff of Flint, is actually going to be providing just a message of encouragement to the men. So if you're available, we would love to invite you to that. And then our last event that we're hosting is our Sundays on Sunday. Uh, that is going to be immediately following service next Sunday. There will be a whole Sunday bar set up in the lobby. So if you guys will put that on your calendars and just plan to join us after service, that will just be an amazing time to just connect, uh, reconnect, and encourage each other going forward in the new year. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to invite everybody to stand up, say hello, and happy new year to the person sitting next to you. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's good to see you. Fun to be here. Man, what a beautiful way to start the morning. Like uh, Nicole was saying, man, beautiful music was awesome. So, hey, we are uh, we are super excited, man, to be here and kicking off our series and identity. Uh, we just think this is going to be a miraculous series, man. Just an opportunity for us to talk about uh, the reality of of the fact that God created us, and for some of us. Um, we believe that deeply. Some we're not sure, but I, I'm convinced of this for me at least, and I, I want it to be true of you. Uh, also in our community here and online, that when we become convinced of a truth that God created us for a purpose on purpose, it begins to change our trajectory. 
changes the way that we see the world, the way that we engage, the way that we move forward. Uh, it really does. And uh, it's interesting how you view yourself, isn't it? At times, uh, it's amazing. I go back and I think about now my son is playing uh, basketball and he played football. And I feel like, I, I don't know about you, but if you're driving kids or grandkids all over the place, you feel like an Uber uh, driver, but you don't get paid, you know, kind of deal. And, uh, and we've been doing that. But I remember going back to basketball, I was thinking of my son and I made him pizza rolls because I used to eat 50 pizza rolls after basketball practice. So I went to Kroger and got a bunch of Destino pizza rolls and made them for Noah, man. And he loved them. And I loved them, and I, I, I tried to eat a ton of them, and I realized I'm not 16 anymore, and it didn't, like, it didn't sit with me well. But, but I, I sat there, and I was reflecting back when I played basketball, and, and, and we had this coach, and he was really aggravated at us this one day, and he, he goes, you guys are losers. you got to pay attention, you know, and he looked at me, and my last name is Roy, and he goes, Roy, he goes, you're the biggest loser of them all. And my buddies were like, and, and I don't know why. Has anybody ever said anything the way that he had said it to me that day? And it stuck with me. And it's interesting, even now at 43 years old, once in a while I'll have that tape play in the back of my mind. And I have to be reminded, hey, I'm God's workmanship. I ain't no loser, right? You got to be reminded of those things from now and then. And it's amazing that even some of the greatest people in history, David, I want to show you in Psalms, says this. He says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? He felt like I did in that moment back in junior high. He was feeling like this in his life. He says, how long will you hide your face from me? God, do you love me? Do you care about me? Do you believe in me? Did you really create me on purpose, for a purpose? God, did you do that? And it's easy to forget in this world. We compare, we get sidetracked, we lose track completely that God created us and God loves us and God is for us. And sometimes when we lose track of that truth that we're going to talk about in this series, we can feel less than, we can feel inadequate, we can become super insecure, and all of a sudden we feel like God is not even for me, he's against me. God, in fact, doesn't even love me. Maybe even God hates me. Because if he loved me, he'd be with me, but he doesn't even feel like he's with me. And maybe you felt like the words of this song in moments that, God, do you love me at all or do you hate me? I don't know what I believe, but 
But it's easier to think you made a mistake with me Do you ever see someone and think, wow, God must hate me? Cause he spends so much time on them with me, he got lazy. Extremely powerful words when you listen to them. There are so many of us right now that walked in here today. And you may have not thought it right away, but when you think about it for a moment, you begin to resonate as you look and you compare and you say, God, look what you did for them, but not me. God, they're not struggling, but I am. God, they feel like they have it all together, but I don't. God, they seem they have no issues, but I have issues at every corner I turn. And the spirit of inadequacy and unworthiness begin to creep in. And we begin to believe these feelings as truth. And this truth becomes ultimately our core tenet of beliefs. And this belief system becomes the way we behave and move through this world. Operating, I want to suggest, on false truth. Because the reality is this. Let me show you. There's something beautiful in the very divine beginning narrative of scripture. God begins to pin in to humanity through the font of grace and love this. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You and I are made in the image of God. And may go day we are image bearers of God in spite of whatever we think or anybody's ever told us or said to us. There is a different identity that we carry that I believe in this series prayerfully and heartfully as we seek that we're going to unlock because we are not walking around as useless, unworthy individuals on in this planet. We are walking around as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We get a chance to walk around as image bearers of God. Think about that for a minute, right? That's incredible, and it changes the way that you see yourself and others in your mission in this world. And so I want to stop and pray for us for a moment here and online, because I'm convinced what we believe about ourselves, more importantly, what we believe God thinks of us, determines our destiny. Jesus, we pray right now and ask you, Father, in this series, how important it is to know that you created us on purpose and for a purpose. We are image bearers of God. Whatever image we thought we carried for all these years, God, you want to rewrite that. You want to remind us and renew in our heart and soul that you love us. We have intrinsic value and purpose in this planet. And so, Jesus, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you ignite something in us today. My, in your name we ask. And everybody said, amen. Man, that was uh, amazing. Didn't the team, haven't the team done an incredible job this morning, by the way, just like leading us through this and... I could never in a million years sing that way, you know, because if I ever tried to sing that one thing is you guys would be like, we love you, but God did not create you to sing. <laughs> Granted, some of us to sing, not all of us, you know, uh, but I, it, it's just amazing to stop and think about the series that we're in the middle of right now, uh, this idea of uh, identity, and, and as we move forward, I'd love to go ahead and take the offering today. Uh, as we do that, I want to thank you so much for all of your generosity all through uh, 2022. Is it crazy to anybody else? We're in 2023, by the way. So here we go, whether you wanted to or not, right? Uh, and, and we're moving along here. Uh, and, and thank you so much for the generosity. Many of you give online. In fact, almost like 90% of us. Uh, and I just want you to know that throughout this past year, man, mission trips have been uh, taken. Uh, churches have been built. Church plants around local Detroit have been uh, happening. Student ministries are growing. K-Kids are growing. Uh, all sorts of cool stuff. We got that men's event. And it's so awesome. I, my, my buddy Chris is coming. And I, I, friend, I don't even know if he's here. Is Matt Carter here right now at all? Can you wave a little bit? Are you around here at all? Right in the back. He doesn't like to be pointed out. Sorry, there he is right there. So he owns Carter's Plumbing at 759. They're going to open up their place. We're going to do burgers, hot dogs, and all sorts of cool stuff for a men's event that Nicole's talking about. And uh, to recharge us, fellas, so mark it on your calendars, Monday night, January 30th. But just really cool stuff going on. And I always want to remind you, 
It is not programs that we're paying into, if you look at it that way. It's an opportunity to be generous to the work of God as he transforms and mobilizes people in a powerful way to make an impact on the world, okay? And I just always want to say that as a reminder of what we're doing. And one way to make an impact, a true impact in this world, is to know who you are, is to really move forward in this reality of, of, of who we are. And this idea of who am I is a big deal, right? Like, who are you, really? Like, when you say, who am I? Have you ever done that for a minute? Have you ever looked in the mirror uh, and, and you're, you just kind of question, like, who you are or what you're doing here? Have you ever had that moment? Am I the only one, right? Uh, no, we've all done that, right? We say, like, who am I? And, and it's amazing. I love it. Finally, somebody got the courage. like, yes, you know, I just did it this morning. Who am I? And, it, and this source is really interesting because this reality, a lot of professionals in the psychological community will say, that they, it's systemic of three questions. They'll, they'll say, when you're trying to answer the question, who am I, about your identity, you, you, you're really saying just that first one is identity. It's saying, like, what's your name? Like, like you know, like, you ever notice when anytime you walk in a room, you're anywhere, you go anywhere, the first thing people ask is, and they're trying to figure out who you are, is, what's your name? You know, and then it goes to the next one, the purpose. They say, what do you do? You know, what do you do? Isn't that interesting? They want to know kind of your identity, like, like, your name, where you're from, your ethnicity, your background, your nationality, or whatever, your socioeconomic status. And then what do you do? How do you contribute? What is your point here on earth? You know, what's your role in this organization? What do you contribute to? How do you actually make an impact? And they're really, in a lot of ways, what happens in those moments, they're assessing your value. Are you important? Do you matter? Uh, like, should I be spending my energy talking to you or spending time with you? But this third question, they say, is the most important one, this concept, and when you're saying, who am I, or who are you, who are we, right, is origin. Where do you come from? Where are you from? And there are moments when I look around at my children, and I'm raising them, and I'm like, where did these kids come from, you know? <laughs> like, who's our, whose kids are these, you know? They're not our kids, but we love them. But, like, wh where, where, are you, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Where did you come? And it's interesting, like, oh, growing up, I grew up in Waterford, and people would begin to know me, like, I, 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 my dad would always go, what's your last name? And I'm like, Roy, as if I forgot it, Dad, jeez, you know? And, but he'd, like, act like it, because everywhere I went, people would go, oh, that's Don Roy's son, Don Roy's son. So I'm like, don't screw up, you know? And people would know, but there's this reality about lineage. This idea of origin is a really a big deal, a bigger deal than we than we think sometimes, right? This idea of lineage, and sometimes you go through scripture and go through, like in Genesis, my wife is reading through the Bible right now, and you can go through Genesis, and, and there's like chapters four and five, and chapter 11 will cover a lot of the lineage of Bible. It's trying to establish origin, and I'm like, oh my gosh, and it's like, so-and-so beget so-and-so, and so-and-so beget so-and-so, you know, is what it feels like, but it's really conveying a, a very an intrinsic and important message. It's trying to establish this lineage or line of where they came from who they belong to. And that's a big deal because our, our family of origin is a huge thing. In fact, I was texting with my brother-in-law a little bit and just talking about some of this stuff. And, and it's a big deal. They say that your formative years happen from zero to eight years of age. And that whatever happens in that time frame is really kind of created your belief system. It kind of created, in a way, your architecture for your synapses to kind of connect right here neurologically and said, this is what I believe about this, thus I'll behave this way. I think this, I'll respond this way. And we work in this operating system the rest of our lives. Isn't that crazy? Right? And they say it's formed cognitively and then physically, and then it goes to socio-emotionally there. And, 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 it, and it rolls out that way. But what's interesting is that in the, in the scientific community, when they're saying this, they're establishing these things and they're true, but they're leaving one out. It's really interesting. In the life of Jesus, when, when he was really becoming who he was, right, like it doesn't say much about his middle years, his upper elementary and middle school and high school and college years. It's kind of like a, a blank slate a little bit with the exception of a few verses, but here's a key one right here. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom, if you would, psychology, the cognitive part, in stature, physiology, and in favor with God, this would be the one that was left out, spirituality, the spiritual part of him, and man, sociology, socio-emotional. So these, these four quadrants we exist in, but I would suggest today that one of the most important ones that we're going to dive into is we step into the book of Ephesians, and I would encourage you too that Nicole had mentioned a text into that. I would text into that. You're going to get daily scriptures. It's going to be entrenched in the book of Ephesians, which is so much about what we're talking about today is your identity. Paul lays out this beautiful blueprint that God gave us about who we are, and who we are is a big deal. 
And so it, I stop and I think about that. That's a huge deal to stop and consider who we are and to begin to think about that in that way. And it, it's, it's interesting. We can, we can stop and we can get caught up in not realizing who we are. And this lineage is established in, in, in Scripture because it's trying to say, ultimately, these people are from this line, and that's their father, and that's their father, and ultimately it stems all the way back to God created them. And knowing your creator, I would suggest strongly. For me, this is what I believe, but I want to suggest it strongly for you. Determines everything about who you are. Determines everything about your intrinsic value. Determines everything about the gifts you were given, the place and time in human history that you were planted here, and the way you're supposed to contribute in this world that we're all searching for so desperately. How do we contribute? How do we matter? How are we valuable? How do we find peace? How do we find real love and real joy? How do we do these things? I would suggest this all is going to go back to this thing, origin. Where do I come from? Who created me? Who made me? Who endowed me with my rights and all these things? Who did this for me? I, I, I would say for me, it's God. For you, I don't know, because if it's anything else, you'll be searching your whole life. And it's interesting about this that I was talking with Lloyd about this a little bit, my brother-in-law. And he said, it's really interesting. Have you ever gone to open your phone and it doesn't recognize you, the face ID? And you're like this. Have you ever done that? And you're like, and you give your phone, you, you all of a sudden you give your phone, you're like, you know what? You give it a dirty look and then it, it like finally will open up or you got to punch in the code or whatever. But, but there's moments in life where we, we're not recognized. We're looking back in the, the mirror of life a little bit and it's not recognizing us and we don't know who we are and we, we're, we're confused. And it, it's, it's interesting, my brother and I all said that normally for a long time research said that it would stop at around eight years or 10 years of age, 12 was the finale, but they're discovering new research because of neuroplasticity. Have you ever heard that big term? He's telling me all these terms, and I'm like, show. I wanted to text back to my brother, and you show off, you PhD candidate, you know? And I didn't do that. He's a super brilliant guy. But uh, because of neuroplasticity, we can keep learning and keep forming and keep changing, which is really good news, super good news, because I want to tell you something. Most of us will go through life and Lisa Turker is an amazing author and speaker and communicator. I want to give you a quote that she said, most of us will spend our time through life kind of truncated at eight, nine years of age and we'll never get beyond feeling less than or unworthy or not good enough or whatever, right? And we don't go beyond that and we spend all of our energy looking for identity and set up to our origin. What I want to suggest strongly today, Paul is too, in the book of Ephesians that we're going to go into, that it's God that we're searching so strongly everywhere else around and right there, she says this, the exhausting manipulation and control it takes to protect an identity based on circumstances will crush our hearts and hide the best of who we are behind a wall of insecurity. Let me say that one more time while you think about this. Have you ever felt exhausted, striving and performing and working so hard to fit the status quo, to fit in the socioeconomic layer that you were in? to keep up with the Joneses, if you would, right? To keep up face with your family, with your workers, whoever. She says the exhausting manipulation, we're always manipulating and control, we're trying to control every outcome. It takes to protect, right, the, what's deep inside of here, not what's out here. What's out here, who cares? What's in here is what really matters. An identity based on circumstances, often in life which you don't have control of. You and I, if you've lived a little bit, not even a long bit, right? A little bit, you know that you have, and I have, hardly any control over circumstances in life usually. We'll crush our hearts, it goes back to the internal, and hide the best of who we are behind a wall of insecurity. So that we never quite move forward. And I, I don't want us to be like that. I don't want us to become this community that never fully takes a risk, that never fully steps out in faith and says, I don't have it all figured out, but I'm going to follow God in this one, man, because I can feel him stirring in my heart. Or, or, or we're, we don't want to do that because we're worried if everybody thinks. Who cares, right? We're worried what's going to happen. I don't know. You know what I mean? My wife is always concerned now asking me, what if you fall off the stage again? I don't know. I may. You know? I mean, who cares? I do a little bit if I hit one of those chairs. But, you know, like, I mean, like, but you can't stop. you got to keep moving and keep going. And a big part of what's holding us back it's this insecurity that Lisa is talking about in our lives. We're, we're manipulating and controlling and trying to give a, you know, a perceived view of who we are when deep inside we're hurting. We watch, so many of us walk in here today or we're watching online, and the truth of the matter is you're actually hurting pretty bad. 
The truth of the matter is you're looking at 2023 and you want to say, I would love to set some goals, but I could never achieve them. That'll never happen. It'll be for somebody else. And that's not the truth at all. And the Apostle Paul jumps in, just like my brother in law saying, he's saying, here's the good news. The good news, the reality is that you have the opportunity to change your future, to live out a life of faith, to live a life when you're 80 or 90 years old, God willing, we make it on right, and we look back and we're so enthralled with the life that God took us on versus looking back and saying, I can't believe I never took a risk. I can't believe I have all these regrets. I can't, like who wants to tell that story to your kids or grandkids, right? If you had to author a book, would you not want the opening chapter to be, I love the life that I got to live, right? I mean, isn't that what, kind of the story? And I'm going to tell you because it's ingrained in us. God is the God of an adventure. And one of the greatest adventures you and I get to go on is discovering who we are. And when we discover who we are, we discover what we're here for. When we discover what we're here for, we discover that we get to make an impact and the people we get to meet and the things we get to do and the adventures we get to go on. Like, this is cool, right? Scripture isn't some archaic text that doesn't matter. It's sacred and God-breathed and beautiful. It's inspiring us at the very depths of our identity of who we are. I want to encourage you, too, that, that I, uh, my wife and I have been talking about this. We read Scripture a lot, and I want to read it a lot more. My wife is already like, where are you at? Like quarter of the way through Scripture right now in the Bible right now. You're cruising through. She's like a speed reader, and I always, I'm like, do you actually understand that? She's like, yes. She's smarter than I am. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> but I'm trying to catch up. So, and I was looking for my Bible this morning uh, in my car somewhere, and I couldn't find it, so I actually stole one from our, uh, our hub. So I don't know if that's okay. It, actually, if there's anything that's okay to steal, it's probably a Bible. So, But I want to encourage you. If you, need, if you don't have one of these, man, they're awesome. You can do it on the Bible app. It's perfect there wherever. But, it, but if you'd really love to have a Bible, this is an NIV study Bible. We have a bunch of them back there. I had an incredible person help me this morning, uh, and I, I, I told her I was going to return it, but I really like this, <laughs> and so I don't know if I want to. So maybe somebody can make a donation for all the Bibles we're going to give away, right? So, but if you don't, we'd love to give you one as a gift, okay? If you're new here, you're checking it out, you don't have a Bible and you'd love one, uh, we'd love to do that because we believe there's something sacred and powerful and living inside of this, right? And so Paul writes this letter, this scripture to the Ephesians who he spent years with. And he was there with them. And it's really amazing. The, the city of Ephesus, really the port of Ephesus in Mesopotamian history, when you look there geographically, was a super important spot for the Roman Empire because so many, I mean, 50, 60, 70 different nations all around would converge there and do commerce and trade. And so they had many gods there they would serve too, pluralistic society uh, and, and Rome didn't care because they're like, whatever, we want you to come here and spend your money and do all this stuff. Uh, but there was this one god, the Artemis. She was the goddess of fertility. She was really the origin of life, and people would worship her, and they would they'd make pilgrimages there, and they would go spend money in, and you know, they'd have to rent a hotel and eat at a restaurant and all those kind of things that you and I would have to do if we traveled somewhere to converge and, and, and be at a, like a uh, you know, conference, as an example. Well, Paul is there and he introduces the gospel and he begins to introduce the gospel about this God that we read in chapter one, right? That he's the author of life and that he created us, male and female, that he created us in his image. And people start going, no way, that's where I came from. Oh my gosh. And it began to change the way they saw themselves and thought about themselves. And so much so that it, it actually began to decrease the pilgrimages that were going there for the you know, goddess of fertility, Artemis. And people were starting to go and worship Jesus and go listen to Paul preach. And, and churches were being planted. And it was like this crazy revolution. And it all came from what we've been talking about. People were discovering, like, who are you? And they were beginning to identify that they were a child of God. They were beginning to understand deeply in a profound way, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that God created them that God was for them, that God was with them, that they had intrinsic value because of the creator of the universe pinned them together, like, like thought of them, loved them, cared for them. This, this was transforming them. And I would suggest strongly again, it's one of the key tenets of our transformative parts of our faith is knowing our origin. Where do we come from? Not just what are we here for, our purpose, and who am I, my name, and where I live, all that kind of stuff, but ultimately, like, God, did you create me on purpose for a purpose? Because if you did, wow, it changes things. And Paul steps into this letter. He's writing now from a prison cell back to the people of Ephesus, and he's encouraging them. He's reminding them, as he is you and I today, about this truth of our identity, 
And so I want to read through the first part of the passage together, and then we'll break it apart a little bit and talk about it. And at the end of the day, uh, we've got some stations that are going to be set up here and there. We've got four of them, and we've got these whiteboards, and we're going to do kind of a kind of a symbolic gesture of faith. We're going to be putting our prints on these boards, and we're going to do something really cool at the end of the series, form a cross, identifying that our identity is in Jesus. But I want you to dig in deep with me over the next few minutes as we do this, because I think that if you and I, together as a community, here and online, all of us, don't really figure out our identity, who we are, how loved we are, how special we are to Jesus Christ, it, it, it'll change the course of our life, either for mediocrity and lacking purpose, or for the craziest adventure you and I have ever been on, feeling more love than we could have ever possibly imagined, in spite of all the junk and mess that we carry. Isn't that good? So here it goes. Ephesians 1, verse 3, says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, that would be Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ." In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan and place of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is a big deal. Paul is saying, do you know, do you understand fully who you are? He's saying in Christ, in fact, through the book of Ephesians, in Christ or in a manner of, of, of similar context and verbiage is 30 times used. He's wanting you to know, who are you? In Christ, you're God's daughter. Who are you? In Christ, you're God's son. Who are you? In Christ, you're God's workmanship. Who are you? In Christ, you're God's creation, right? Like, like he's sharing this, he's emphasizing it because he knows it's the very cornerstone of our existence and identity. It doesn't matter our cognitive level, how intelligent we become. It doesn't matter our, our physiology, how physical, our proudness, whatever we can do, socioeconomically, our status in this world. All these things will fall short and leave us hanging when it comes down, when our head is like hitting the pillow at night, we can't get to sleep, and we need to know, is there a God out there? And if so, does he love me? And Paul's saying, it's even better. Not only does he love you, he created you. And I want to break down this scriptures, if we could, because there's some beautiful things that it says. It says, we are chosen in Christ. You and I are chosen in Christ, right? Does this bring anybody back to like middle school, like in PE class and gym class, and everybody's getting picked for sides, and you're like, dear Lord, pick me, dear Lord, right? And so-and-so gets picked, and so-and-so gets picked. And so, and, and like, we are chosen in Christ. This is a huge deal. I my, uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm not even trying to bust Chuck, my wife. But like sometimes you watch The Bachelor. I'm not, it's like not, no, nah, she doesn't watch it anymore. We did. But anyhow, it was years ago, years ago. Now you haven't recently. You haven't recently. I'm sorry. You haven't recently. My wife does not watch The Bachelor. I'm going to get in so much trouble later for this. I feel like you have. All the shows sometimes seem like that. Anyhow, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you get up here and try to talk like this and not say anything that you mess up with once in a while. So, so anyhow, people that watch The Bachelor, right? <laughs> whoever they are, they're good people. They're good people, uh, whoever they are, <laughs> if they watch. But I love it because it comes down to this crazy moment, the final rose, you know, and who's going to get chosen? And people are just devastated when they're not chosen, you know? And the people that get chosen are, and they say these crazy statements because they're getting ready to be, you know, helicoptered off to Italy for a restaurant too. And they're like, if we can make it through this, we can make it through anything. And I'm like, I sure hope so. I'm like, this is the best thing of your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
if we can make it through this, we make it there. You know, and they're, they're there. And, and it's like, but this, this thing to be chosen, to be selected. And, and I, I think I just want to encourage you. It's why I'm really, I'm, I'm serious too about that. Um, and, and I probably get in trouble or whatever. But like, I want to give away all these Bibles. I want us to be in the scripture more because there's something about it. When I look at the people that are in these stories in the scripture and I think about their lineage and our heritage that's connected to them, I'm like, our stories are supposed to be really profound like theirs are, right? I don't want to just read about great stories. I want to live one. I don't want to hear about amazing things that take place in everybody else's life. I'd like to go through them too, would you not? Right? I, I don't want to just know about the, the biggest hardships that life will bring, that somebody was all alone and then God showed up and it transformed it. I want to be going through the most difficult part of my life and God shows up in my life. And Paul is saying, do you know we are chosen in Christ? We weren't left out. We weren't picked last. We weren't you know, like picked over or second guessed us. He loves us and picked us and he chose us. And I think about this. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. And then it says, blameless in his sight and in love. Before he thought of anything else, before he thought of creation itself, if you would, if you'd bring yourself with me, wherever you're at in this, to this narrative of God creating all that we know and all that exists, the expanding, profound, immense universe and our planet that we're on that is one of just like billions of galaxies that we fall in that's perfectly like, you know, calibrated by the sun and we're here. Before God thought of any of this beauty and eloquence of the universe that we know, he thought of you and I. He was thinking of you. And he chose you before the foundation of the world and he found you blameless in Christ. And there's so many things that you and I will blame each other for. How could anybody pick me? Why would anybody select me? Why would anybody want me? Why would anybody actually deeply care about me if they really knew who I was? Why, why, why would my, you know, we feel this way. We don't admit this out loud, but you and I, we go through this stuff, don't we? We feel this. Why, why would anybody really unconditionally love me if they really totally knew me? What if I screw up again? You probably will. I will too. Probably let somebody down again. So will I. You're pro- We're all going to do that. But nonetheless, Christ unconditionally chooses us. And it goes on. This choosing, this selection leads to a more indemnification, something that's solidified, something that's going to be permanent in this moment. It says that we are adopted in Christ, this w- term of adoption, this term of a familial term, creating family. God's heartbeat, as you read through Scripture, he's consistently architecting and building a family. I, I think that's so profound. It says, Jesus says of himself, that, uh, and it said of him, that he's going to be the firstborn of many brethren. It's interesting when you look at family lineage, it says that from one person, Adam and Eve, like this couple, comes all humanity. And sin flew with it and brokenness and hurt and pain. But from this second Adam, referring to Christ, Scripture says, Paul says about him, all of a sudden there's a new humanity. In fact, we're going to talk about that in chapters 3 and 4, that God has a desire to bind everybody together, every ethnicity, every nationality, every person, even Republicans and Democrats. Right? He's going to bring them all. The, only Christ can do that. <laughs> Is that okay to say? I don't know. Because he loves us, each other, and he wants us to love each other. He does. He's like this parent, this amazing parent that's like, oh my gosh, my kids love one another. Debate, heaven differences, great but love one another. And only Jesus has the ability to do this in creating one new humanity. These familiar terms, and he says, I want this to be permanent. I don't want this love to be shortened, or I don't want it to be indifferent, I don't want it to be undone. I want it to be adopted. I want it to be permanent, adopted in, grafted in, placed within as always to be a part of. Do you see? Like this is the permanency that Christ is painting here, and it's, it's beautiful, this idea he says, the spirit I'm giving you, Jesus says. And he's talking about Paul. Paul says, this is the spirit that he's giving us. He says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. It doesn't make you a slave to religion. It doesn't make you less than if you can only come a couple times a month here. It doesn't make you less than if you can't serve. It doesn't make you less than if you're not religious. It doesn't make you less than or slaves to performance or slaves to identity of social class. Any of that at all. This spirit you receive does not make you slaves to anything at all so that you can live in fear. Again, Paul's a 
Jesus doesn't want that. He wants you to be family, not afraid, fully loved, not full of fear, feeling less than all the time. Rather, the spirit you receive, I receive, we've received. For those of us that would say, we're in Christ. I love Christ. I know Jesus. I know that he loves me unconditionally. I follow him. He's my savior, right? Receive, brought about your adoption to sonship or to made you a family, a son or a daughter. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is unbelievable. We actually cry the word Abba means daddy. Isn't that cool? And it's like mommy, I, like Desi always go, where's my mommy? Where's my daddy? I, and, I, and I love it, but like it's saying like there's a familiar term and it's endearing. It's from the heart of a child calling out to their parent, to their father, to mother, right? Like it's, it's that way. Paul says that's what you get. You've been adopted. Part of your identity is not just this slave to religion. It is indemnified. It is forever a relationship with the God of the universe that you can actually call daddy. I mean, this like undoes religion. It puts it up on his head, right? Rules and performing and status and if I'm good enough means nothing. In fact, scripture says of us that our righteousness and our best days, our very best was never really good enough. And because of God's great profound love for us and the work that Jesus Christ does on this cross that we're going to talk about in week three, that it doesn't matter that he brings us in anyhow. And it's so beautiful to stop and think about this. And I stop and I think about this idea of adoption, I told my wife and I, it's, we're learning, of course, so much about it. There's so much we don't know, we don't understand. And the one thing that I find to be this common denominator within it is this unconditional love. I'm beginning to realize that, and though we don't disregard it because it has great meaning, but it doesn't come down to ethnicity, it doesn't come down to nationality, it doesn't come down to social status, it doesn't come down to these things. Yeah, we have to be observant and watch and navigate these things with wisdom, but ultimately this binding force is this unconditional love, this desire to be family. And when I think, where does it come from? I'm reading through the scriptures and I'm understanding more and more. I'm understanding so much I don't get, but I'm starting to get a glimpse and understand, God, your heart was family. God, you wanted to adopt us. You wanted this to be permanent. You wanted to be my father. Like no matter how bad I screw up, you love me. No matter how I let people down, you're with me. No matter how much I feel like this could never be reconciled or everything's undone, you can redo it. You can help me, right? Like this is a powerful thing to have the God of the universe who identifies himself as a father, as the lover of who we are in our corner, and we get access to all things, Paul says, in heavenly places and spiritual blessings, love and joy and peace and patience. If you read Galatians 5, 22, it embodies the fruits of the Spirit, these nine fruits of the things that I would suggest you and I strive for as humanity with everything in our heart and can never obtain because they, the cost, there's something we can never pay. It's a gift freely given, Paul says, through Jesus Christ. Like, this is amazing what we get. And think about this, like my son will go, can I drive your car? Sometimes I'm like, yeah, because it's got gas in it. I'm, re I'm realizing what he's doing. Then he drives my gas out and says, I got no gas in my car. I'm like, dude, you know, but like, this is cool. You know, and, and, and when he learns a scripture, he can go, yeah, but dad, you're my father. And so like heavenly places and speedway and spiritual blessings, like a gas card. But this is like so much greater than that. You know, this is unbelievable what he's allowing us to have. And I think about even scripture like Zephaniah 3. It says that the Lord would sing over us. Like he would sing over you and I. And I know some of us. Some of you are not morning people. Some of you like you can get up in the morning if people are singing, you tell them to shut up. <laughs> you tell them to sing that song later. <laughs> you know who you are. You need about, you know, anywhere from two to 17 cups of coffee and then you're good. Then you're ready to go. And there's people that get up and you just think they hit the lotto. And they haven't, and you just, you know, it's funny. I used to be one of those growing up, but I feel like I've switched somehow, which I don't know what's happened there. But, but it's amazing to stop and consider heavenly blessings and spiritual plight. We've been adopted. And I, I wish we had all the time in the world to go through this, but I want to keep encouraging you have to dive into this scripture, and it goes further than that. This next thought, this final thought that Paul brings up, he says we're adopted to Christ, says that we are marked with a seal, it says, when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This is so amazing. Jesus says, it's better that I leave. And the disciples are like, what? It's better that I leave? Because if I leave, it's going to be unbelievable for you. I, I need to leave 
so you can have the Spirit of God that's going to live in you, and he's going to be with you, and he's going to guide you, and he's going to comfort you, and he's going to teach you in all the ways that I have, and, and I'm never going to leave you even to the ends of the world. How's that possible? Because the Spirit of God will be with you. And he says this seal, my, my sons have this hat, Pistons, they're, they're fans, even though it's hard to be a fan. What, I think they're like 11 and 33, but go Pistons, you know? But this hat, but there's, they, the, my boys do this, they all keep the seal. If you, you have kids or grandkids that already do this. They keep Because I'll look at their hat and I'll go to over their hat and I'm like, hey, we got to pull that seal off. They're like, oh, don't touch that. Don't touch it, right? It's got a seal right here and that seal signifies it's authentic. It's the real deal. It's genuine. I mean, this is an NBA hat. Dad, this might as well have been created by the NBA players themselves, right? It's like, th- that's what it is. But the seal of the Holy Spirit is so much more significant Then in this world, when you feel like I'm not good enough or I can't do this or whatever, God says, no, 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 I've sealed you. You're you're my daughter. You're my son. You're my loved one. I'm with you. The world's against you. I'm for you. Let's go after it, right? Like you're ready to give up? Get up. I'm with you right now. You're ready to think that you're no good and not valuable? God says, are you kidding me? I knit you together in the darkness of the womb. I was there cheering you on before the foundations of the world. I created you and thought about you. Like that voice, that power is with you and I, and it transforms us and mobilizes us to make an impact in this world that we never could without it. And so Paul's saying, the seal is the deal, man. It's awesome, and it signifies that you're significant, and it undoes whatever has been said of you, that you're not worthy, you're no good, you're you're washed up, you're never going to make it. The seal reminds you, the Holy Spirit, that's garbage. Let me whisper in your ear who you really are. Or when you read scripture, when you go steal a Bible like Jeremiah did, and you read in these scriptures, you're going to begin to understand who you are and whose you are and how loved you are. It transforms everything. This is beautiful. Marked with that seal. And this final thought, being reminded who God says you are, is best understood reflecting on where we were. I just want to read the scriptures in Ephesians 2. Paul jumps there real quick. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. I don't know where you are, but I would say at times it's hard to refute the reality. Doesn't it feel like you're in spiritual warfare moments? I would suggest you are. Following the curse of this word, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We did whatever we wanted, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Have you ever looked around and you read the news and you see the feeds that are going on? You're like, why on earth would they do that? How could they do that? I would suggest there's a prince in the power of the air and he puts in a spirit of disobedience and disregard to God and disregard for humanity to do whatever they want and according to the lust of their flesh and have havoc in this world. And Jesus is trying to reconcile this and he first reconciles you and I in our hearts and then he works through us as ministers of reconciliation and ambassadors of truth to help reconcile the world. That's why we gather. That's why we equip. That's why we disciple. That's why we go global is to spread the good news that transforms people's lives that Paul's been talking about. But first must be recognized we were dead in our trespasses. And isn't it it's just profound to me that the Spirit of God will move and He transforms people's hearts? My friend Chris and I were texting a couple days ago, and I, 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 I'm blown away that you're sitting there in your truck just several months ago, and the Spirit of God moves in your life on you and says, Quit being disobedient, quit following the ways of all this, and follow me again. And you do, and it transforms your life. And I think of our life, I think of my life. I'm going in one direction, and the Spirit of God calls us to another direction. My cousin Sean told us it was over Christmas of this song. It's called Son of a Sinner. It's by a guy named Jelly Roll. And I'm like, man, that is, I thought a crazy name, and now I can't get his name out of my mind. Jelly Roll, you know. It's a cool name. But, but the album he has is called Ballads of the Broken. And he says, I'm just a long-haired son of a sinner, searching for ways I can get done, looking for a high, looking for peace, looking for calm. He says, I'm one drink away from the devil, And one call away from home, I'm always somewhere in the middle. I feel like in our life we don't realize that Paul is saying you're you're somewhere in the middle. And God's inviting you here in a spirit of obedience to follow Jesus, to get these heavenly blessings and spiritual places and spiritual realms and to be adopted and chosen and marked with this seal and know who you are and your identity in Christ, right? 
And there's this other part that's, isn't it? It's tugging us this way. And we can find ourselves vacillating in the middle. And Jesus doesn't want us to vacillate. Being in the valley of uncertainty is like death after a while. We've got to get out. I don't know about you, but I've got to get out. I can't stand still forever. It, 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 like stagnancy, like being there. Have you ever looked at just like a stagnant pond? Nobody wants to jump in that. I do that. We want to be part of fresh flowing fluid water, which is what Jesus is described as and God is described as all through Scripture. And I want to bring you to the spot. Ephesians 2. 4 through 6 says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love, I love this. Don't you love there's always this moment, but God, it's the greatest part of the movie, the turning point, right? But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you kidding me? (laughs) This is crazy. And I think about, look what verse, I just want to go to verse 10. Look what verse 10 says. For we, Kensington Clarkson, you and I, here and online, everybody you've ever laid eyes on in this planet, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You and I were called to live a life that was going to make an impact discovering who we are in Christ, what we are created to do, and living out that destiny to walk them out. That was, that's you and I. We get to be part of this. And I just think so many of us can get stuck in these moments where we don't believe. God couldn't have created me, doesn't love me. I could never make a big impact in this world. And the, the opposite is true. Yes, you were created in Christ. Yes, if you put your trust in him, you can make a huge impact in this world. And I just stop and I, I just think about even like what we're going to do today. We're going to have an opportunity to stand together and come forward together. And, and, and you're going to have these little pads you put your thumbprint on. And you're going to pop it on those boards. Don't worry, we're not going to take like your identity or anything. But, but the, why do you think people are so enthralled in Ancestry.com and all this kind of stuff? Because they, they know like there's something significant about knowing who you are, where you came from. And I think about this for, I'm God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. They do good works that God prepared beforehand. And I'm called to walk them out. I might trip them out, fall them out, <laughs> do whatever I'm out, right? But I'm called to walk them out, and I want to walk them out. I don't want to sit down in this one. I don't want to sit out, right? Do you? You don't want to sit down in the greatest race you've ever been invited to run. You want to run. I just think that you and I, we have an opportunity as we look the forecast of 2023, whatever it might be, on your news feed and articles, forget it for a moment. Look to the creator of the universe and say, God, what are you forecasting for my life this year? What are you forecasting today for me? Will you remind me maybe today that I'm your workmanship, created in you to do good works, that you prepared before you thought of anything else, you thought of me, and you want to walk them out with me? That's incredible. For you and I, he thinks that. I think about growing up, I was, I think it was like third grade, and I, I was struggling in elementary school, and I, does anybody remember Hooked on Phonics? They were Hooked on Phonics fans, like now he has all these different things, and the teacher told my mom, Jeremiah's going to need to get on this, he's never going to speak well, he's never going to read good, he's never going to do any of this stuff at all, you know, and my mom was like so like mama bear central, came out like crazy, and she's like, he's going to read great and do this and do it. Mom, do you remember that <laughs> we did all this? And so we did this. And, I, and it's so crazy. There's a part of me thinking today, like, holy cow, I definitely am never going to sing. And that's okay. I'll sing in the shower, in the car, or whatever, right? But isn't it nuts? I would love to go visit the teacher and be like, do you know what I get to do all the time? <laughs> I get to talk. I get to speak. I get to, you know, I get to do this. And it was interesting. There was like a disbelief in her and a belief in my mom. And I think about, now think about, translate that, this belief that God has in you. He's whispering in your ear something beautiful. He's like, you're my workmanship. Created in me a new work, a new life, a new creation. And I've been dreaming about you before anything else. And I'm inviting you to walk this out with me. And I I think we have this beautiful privilege to do this today. I want to show you just a couple of these slides that our, our, our team, Carly, had put together. Some of these verses to remind ourselves of. They're so beautiful. This is just in through Ephesians. I am redeemed and forgiven in Christ. I have a wonderful inheritance of spiritual riches in Christ. 
I am sealed by the Holy Spirit who guarantees inclusion into the family of God. Right? I have access to spiritual wisdom. I participate in the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Like as a member of the body of Christ, I'm united to the Lord and represent him on earth. Like this is powerful. We're going to put this on social media and stuff, but you're going to get these all through this month being reminded of who you are in Christ. And so I want to invite you to stand right now with me as we pray. And I'm going to invite you to say, this doesn't change anything what we're going to do to come down and we'll have boards that'll come up here and we're going to have four stations, two here and two over there. And whether you're in the back, you can go to these two in the front and come here. I want to invite you to come down and actually just be able to take that thumbprint and put that on there in that board because we want to do something as a community and, and shine Christ and make this cross at the end of the series. But who you are in Jesus Christ changes everything, absolutely everything. And so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to go find my wife and we're going to go over there and do that. Ushers will be down here and put these boards up over here too. And uh, man, I think it's going to be just a symbolic moment for us to be reminded of who we are in Jesus. And so let's pray. Father, I just ask you right now, God, that you, um, Lord, that you just remind us who we are in you, Christ. We are a workmanship. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are cared for. We have been adopted, chosen, and sealed by your Holy Spirit. And so I pray today that people maybe for the first time put their trust in you, Jesus, or be renewed and reminded of that we belong to you. And so Christ, I ask that you just your spirit moves in our community. You lead our community in a beautiful way. We love you and we ask this in your name, Christ. And everybody said, amen. So join me down here. You can just start making your way forward and doing that. We got two stations here. We'll have two stations over here as the worship team leads us.
you have an incredible day, man. God bless you. Thank you for participating today. Uh, we love you. Here goes to a great 2023 in Christ, man. Take care.